I think it's about time we had like a national dialogue. We all sat down together and discussed what are what are the expectations that our athletes are facing as they're serving national service. The big story today, Joseph Schooling speaking out about the challenges of balancing NS and training. The crowds are back, but is the recovery here to stay? We'll find out from the Restaurant Association of Singapore. And talk about a hiring spree. More than 9,400 new jobs are up for grabs in the financial sector. Good evening, you're watching The Big Story with me, Hairianto Diman. Subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you will not miss a single episode. Swimmer Joseph Schooling making waves with his comments calling for a national dialogue on national service, highlighting the need to manage the expectations of national athletes undergoing NS. The Olympic gold medalist who enlisted in January was speaking to media at the Maidin Water Sports Palace in Hanoi yesterday a day after he wrapped up his SEA Games campaign with two goals and a bronze. His smallest haul at the biennial meet, though he competed in only four events. I think it's about time we had like a national dialogue. We all sat down together and discussed what are, what are the expectations that our athletes are facing as they're serving national service. You know, national service is something that everyone needs to do. None of us are shying away from that. But look, we need to manage expectations, right? Like the reality of it. So what do you want out of all of us? At the end of the day, I'm gonna step up there and do my best, no matter if, if I'm in the shape I am or I'm not. But as the people watching on TV, they have a lot of expectations of ourselves. And we as athletes, we wanna match those expectations. We have high expectations. So it's all about how we can both grow together and how NS and I guess sporting achievements can coincide. And I think we're on the right track we just need to sit down, ask some tough questions. It's going to be rough, but I think we're going to come out on the right side at the end of the day. With more is sports editor Lee Yulin. Yulin, what do you make of Schooling's call for a national dialogue for NS? What do you think he hopes will come out of this? I think this is a conversation that is long overdue. Athletes struggling to juggle their sporting commitments and national service is an issue that has been around for decades. Privately, many male athletes and their families have spoken to us about the difficulties they face. But people should remember one thing. Joe is not calling for an exemption for himself, nor for his fellow athletes. What he is asking for is a common and a civil platform to discuss the expectations that are placed on athletes doing NS. Why? Because at the end of the day, society still expects the athletes to perform and win medals. I'll give you an example. The other night when Joe swam 52.22 and won gold, I thought to myself, geez, that's quite a slow time. But then I remembered, he's doing NS. He hasn't been able to train at his usual levels. Cut him some slack. But sadly, the public are not like this. When our athletes win, they cheer. When they don't, many cheer, particularly on social media. So this is not just hurtful, but also deeply frustrating and discouraging for our athletes. Yulin, separately, there have also been reports about uh, schooling retiring from the sport. What has he said about it? There's been a lot of speculation about when Joe will call it a day. Yes, there have been small hints here and there in media interviews, but he did tell my colleague Kim Quack that he isn't ready to be done and again reiterated that he had not lost the motivation to swim and race. However, this year has thrown up a curveball with the postponement of the Asian Games in China. That was going to be his other major meet for the year and now his calendar has to be recalibrated. He now has to sit down with the Swimming Association and come up with a plan for what's next. How, the, how will this be framed? I think Joe summed this up when he said these words. Hopefully, we'll understand what I can do given the current circumstances versus what's realistic. Yulin, thank you for the Perspectives Sports Editor, Lee Yulin. Meanwhile, latest from the SEA Games in Hanoi, Contessa Low winning gold in the Women's Archery Individual Compound event. It is Singapore's first archery gold since the 2013 Games nine years ago.
It's another goal for Lucas Teo, this, this time teaming up with Brendan Wee in the men's kayak K2 1000 meter final for Singapore's second gold in canoeing. Well done, guys. And the men's bowling team had to settle for bronze today behind the Philippines and Malaysia. The quartet of Jerry's Go, Timothy Tam, Chia Ray Han and Darren Ong earlier claimed a silver and a bronze in the doubles. A look at other headlines. Parents looking to register their children for admission to Primary 1 next year will be able to do so from June 29th. The Education Ministry says registration will be conducted online with no in-person registration at schools. And changes announced last year will be introduced in this exercise, including the doubling of non-priority places for pupils with no ties to a school. Now, looking to embark on a career in the finance sector, well, the Monetary Authority of Singapore estimates that there will be more than 9,400 new jobs on offer this year, with about a third of them in technology. MES Chief Ravi Menon says that Singapore needs to grow a strong local talent pool while attracting global talent, and stresses that it's not a Singaporean's only strategy when it comes to building a strong Singaporean core. The restrictions are gone and the crowds are back. Restaurants and other FMB outlets across Singapore are seeing a steady increase in customers dining in since COVID-19 rules were relaxed last month. But is the recovery here to stay? Trade and Industry Minister Gan Kim Yong says it's vital for the food services sector to capture new growth opportunities and to create new revenue streams as we emerge from the pandemic. In 2021, the industry added $4 billion to Singapore's economy and employed about 220,000 workers. Joining me now is Keith Chua, Vice President of the Restaurant Association of Singapore. Keith, looks like things are picking up for the FMB sector, at least from what we can see from the latest easing of measures. Uh, but in general, is it back to pre-pandemic levels? Well, the... The fact is that yes, things are things are certainly picking up since the relaxation of measures in the recent uh, weeks. Are we back to pre-pandemic levels? No, not yet. Um, but we are heading in the right direction, and we hope to get there. Uh, why? Why do I say we're not quite there? Well, pre-pandemic, uh, we had besides the domestic market, we also had the international market. Uh, we had the tourists that also uh, supplemented or at least provided quite a significant part of. Uh, revenues uh, for the wider food and beverage sector. So depending on which concepts we're talking about and which markets we're targeting, our concepts are targeted at, uh, some would have uh, recovered uh, pretty much to pre-pandemic levels. Others would still be awaiting the, uh, the, the tourist market to supplement uh, the, the um, revenue levels. With the food and beverage industry, we're talking about revenues and then we're also talking about three the three main components of our uh, operating costs, uh, which are manpower, uh, uh, rentals, and food costs. Um, so those are uh, not also, I guess you could say, not not quite at pre-pandemic levels, uh, but they are adjusting, uh, and and we'll we'll see in the coming months uh, how how these will stabilize. The pandemic has shown that deliveries or takeaways now play a big role in the industry, and of course earlier on in the restaurant. Uh, Asia 2022, Minister Gan also mentioned about uh, looking at uh, different revenue streams. If you could share with us uh, some examples of uh, these revenue streams that FMB businesses can create as we emerge from the pandemic. With the pandemic, you know, many of our uh, uh, food operators, we very, ha very quickly had to move into delivery and takeaway as uh, means of sustaining or you know, as, a, as a means of sustaining our revenue levels and, and essentially for, for survival. Uh, and we've managed to uh, build that in now into our operating infrastructure. Uh, the uh, hope, I think, for many of us that, that, that were not in delivery and takeaway pre-pandemic uh, is that we can, sustain, we can keep a good portion of, of 
that while we see the dining in returning. Uh, so, so that's uh, you know uh, uh, that's something that, that that we hope for. Now, in addition to the alter the options and, and what was mentioned by Minister, uh, we do have uh, the uh, opportunity for for those uh, concepts that are appropriate to scale, for example, to look uh, beyond Singapore, move into international markets, internationalization. I think that 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 would be certainly a good uh, good option. And some, of course, have already done that, and some will continue to 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 build on that. Uh, then we have uh, ready to eat foods. Uh, if the brand itself has a good following, uh, there will be a market who will find that convenience uh, in terms of availability of those items uh, through uh, uh, retail uh, uh, retail delivery platforms. I think those will be. Uh, another way of uh, enhancing um, revenue streams. I can think of another uh, another area that some have already ventured into, in terms of using capacity, and that's to set up cloud kitchens. So you can you can you can also have a restaurant with a primary brand, but you can also have a cloud kitchen that uh, is uh, uh, just focusing, say, on the on on, on the virtual uh, market platform uh, to either test new concepts that could eventually be delivered in physical form. Keith, thank you for the insights. Keith Chua, Vice President of the Restaurant Association of Singapore. The big day is getting closer and I cannot wait. Tom Cruise making a triumphant return in Top Gun Maverick opening in Singapore on May 25th. Lucky few like our film correspondent John Lui have already seen it. John, the sequel has been more than 30 years in the making and delayed a couple of times because of the pandemic. Is it worth every bit? You're right, this is one of the most anticipated films this year. I think Top Gun came out before you were born. I think the, the word the Navy would use is uh, you weren't operationally ready yet when it first came out. Um, I think I was doing NS when it came out and uh, I think the first movie, as they say, struck a chord with a lot of people because I think one thing that the first movie did that helped it earn $350 million worldwide in 1986 is that it really made being a pilot cool. Director Tony Scott back then, he had a way of making it look realistic but at the same time exciting and very cool. So that movie created a lot of catchphrases like I have a need for speed it made the songs you know danger zone and take my breath away it went to the top of the charts so you know this is a movie that a lot of people have a lot of very pleasant nostalgia factor attachments to John having said that you know the nostalgia you know and and now finally coming back after more than 30 years how would you rate the movie? Okay, now, like the title suggests, this is all about Maverick and you're going to get 200% Maverick. I'm going to call this film Dr. Cruz in the Multiverse of Maverickness because you're going to get all the flavours of Maverick. So, the thing about the film is that there's so much of him that he plays everything. He's the love interest. And in terms of character, he's both Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. He's both the mentor and the hero, the chosen one. One thing I did like was that you know, sequels, they like to go really big and really loud. And one thing that this thing keeps from the original film is the sense of realism. It's a sense that, you know, as they say in the film, it's the pilot, not the plane. So it's not um, cars flying into space. It's not cars, you know, like a certain sequel that we all know. Cars going underwater and landing on a submarine. So it keeps it realistic and it's still pretty exciting in places. As always, John, appreciate your candor. That was film correspondent John Lui. Now, with inflation rising, you might be looking for ways to keep your bills under control. ST Food Online editor Hedy Koo has tested a few recipes that are budget-friendly and won't hurt the wallet. Hedy, tell us about your first dish, the clay pot egg tofu. 
These recipes are part of a series called Family Dinners Under $10. Tofu is a common and economical ingredient. A lot of people might think of it as bland and boring. That's why I'm here to show you a couple of ways to jazz it up. So yes, clay pot egg tofu is one way to get your family excited for a cheap but cheerful dinner. A tube of Fortune egg tofu, about 150 grams, costs $1 each at fair price. I got them on sale, two tubes for $1.75. Some home cooks cut each tube into five pieces. I prefer it to quarter it as larger pieces remain juicy and substantial after deep frying. It is a basic stir fry of vegetables. Add some oyster sauce and seasoning. Transfer that into your clay pot. In with the tofu and you are done. A zi cha or even restaurant-worthy dish right on your dinner table. Mmm, I sure hope you like tofu because Hedi's second dish also features Bean curd. For something quite different, especially for those who don't want to fire up the stove, try this dish of pitan tofu, which is tofu with century egg. You don't need cooking skills, just throw it together. You need a blender to make the sauce. This is my take on an appetizer that I had at an izakaya, but it can be a light meal on its own. You need two century eggs for this, one to use as garnish and the other to use for the sauce. So you take one and blend it with a little mirin, cooking sake and sesame dressing and you've got your sauce. So just throw on the other sliced up century egg, put on some tobiko and spring onion and it's all good. You know what, Hedy? I've never been excited about tofu. Now I am. Thank you so much. That was SD Food Online Editor, Hedy Koo. For more tofu dishes, check out Hedy's story at str.sg forward slash live. Try her easy to follow recipes and get cooking. And do look out for the next part of her series called Family Dinners Under $10. In a new series called Conversations on the Future, U.S. Bureau Chief Nirmal Ghosh speaks to prominent global thinkers about critical issues and trends. Here's the latest instalment featuring Chen Chui Fan. I speak with award-winning science fiction writer Chen Chui Fan, who has been called China's William Gibson on hyper-reality and the future of humankind. In AI 2041, we like try to imagine 10 different scenarios which human society might gonna co-evolve with technology such as AI and robotic, etc. And I think the intendency of separating everyone and have them trapped in their own small information bubble is what's happening right now. The full episode is on our YouTube channel where you can also find more videos. Now remember to subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Harianto Diman. See you tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.